Hi folks, Mr. Ackerman here. Thanks for watching. The topic of today's video is gravitational potential energy at the Earth's surface. And if this topic sounds familiar, then that's good. We did learn about it in grade 11, and to a very large extent, today's video is a recap of grade 11 ideas. But there are some areas that uh, lead to some misconceptions sometimes, so I would like you to pay careful attention, especially when we get to the end of the video and we answer some common questions about gravitational potential energy, and we try to avoid those misconceptions. However, uh, at this point, what I'd like you to do is just pause the video and have a look at the questions we're going to answer, as well as where we are in the unit schedule, and finally, what are the learning goals and success criteria. So please pause the video now and have a look at those. Okay, and you're back. We're going to dive right into the topic here. The first question, what do we mean by gravitational potential energy? Well, before we can answer that question, we should really just briefly revisit a topic that you've probably discussed many times in science, the idea of potential energy. Uh, commonly, this is described in most science classes as stored energy that could be used to accomplish a task or to do work. If you think of, for example, the chemical potential energy in the bonds of, let's say, the molecules that make up gasoline, we know that if we put gasoline into our car, there's the ability to do work, to get the car moving. Of course, until combustion occurs, until we turn on the engine, that potential is not realized, but the energy is there. Same goes for food energy and the breakfast that you eat in the morning and the meals throughout the day and so on. Well, gravitational potential energy is a form of energy that you could say objects possess by virtue of the fact that they are, let's say, higher up than other objects. For example, look around the room that you're in. Maybe there's a bookshelf with some books that are above the ground. If the bookshelf were to break and those books were to fall down, they would suddenly start moving much more rapidly as they fell, and therefore they would be gaining kinetic energy. And of course, we all understand and believe in the law of conservation of energy, so you'd be wondering, where did that energy come from? Well, something to do with gravity, and so to uh, to, to understand where that energy comes from, we say that previous to falling, the objects had gravitational potential energy. And that, of course, is what we're talking about in today's lesson. Gravitational potential energy, therefore, you get by raising an object up above a certain height. Now, let's think about what's involved in lifting something. If you start out at the floor and you take an object, so I'll draw you here, and you take your hand and you lift it, let's say this object has a certain mass, m, and you lift it up a certain height, let's say this is the book that you're placing on top of that, <coughs> that shelf, uh, think about it for a minute, what sort of force do you have to apply on this object? Well, at the very least, you've got to overcome gravity. So the force required to lift it would equal the force of gravity, which of course we know is mg. And how far would you be lifting this? Well, let's imagine that the distance is delta d. Well, right away, we've got a force being applied. We've got a distance over which the force is acting. So now I can jump to my second question here. How does this relate to work? Well, remember, work is equal to the force, the magnitude of the force that you apply, times the displacement of that force, times the cosine of the angle between this vector and that vector. So looking back at the diagram here, we were applying a force upward and we were displacing the object upward. So this force here up, I'll put in vector symbols to make that clear. The displacement would be a certain number of meters also up. The angle between up and up is of course zero degrees. So down here, you're going to input mg as your force. Uh, delta d, well, sometimes in physics when we're talking about a change in height, like a vertical displacement, we write that as delta h. And so I'm gonna put that in here. And finally, the cosine of zero degrees, which of course is equal to one. What do we end up with? mg delta h. And this is the work done to lift an object from one place to another. And now, of course, we say it's gained the potential to do work. For example, it could fall down, pick up kinetic energy, 
Where did that kinetic energy come from? Well, we say it comes from the work or the energy that we stored in the object when we lifted it. And so, very simply, here's your formula for the potential energy that an object has by virtue of the fact that it was raised up above a certain point. You'll often see it written as this, delta EG, the change in gravitational potential energy, is equal to the, its mass, the object's mass, times 9.8, times the change in height. And if you think of delta as final minus initial, then we can write this as delta H would be height final minus height initial. And so if we expand this out, we'll get mg height final minus mg height initial. And that means that eg final is this, and eg initial is this. And so some people like to write that the gravitational potential energy is equal to mg times your height, slightly different than delta eg equals mg delta h. You could think of this as the absolute value of your gravitational potential energy, and you could think of this one as the change in the gravitational potential energy when you move from one height to another. And when you do some of the homework questions, uh, hopefully you'll be able to see how these two relate to one another. But they're, they're very nearly the same. Um, I might get in trouble for saying that if some other physics teacher is watching. They're, they're not exactly the same, I should say, but they, they're so closely related. A couple of these go into making this, as you can see, a final minus initial. So let me put it to you this way. They, they often lead to some confusion, but when you're solving problems, most students can get by um, considering the two as being nearly the same. It, it may not be the ideal situation, but such is life. All right, let's go on and take a look at another question here. What is a reference point and why is it important? Well, I want you to consider two situations. Uh, you are maybe, maybe you're watching this in school, maybe it's your lunchtime, and uh, maybe you are sitting on the second floor of the school building. So let me put you up here. You're, uh, you're standing, you're watching on your smartphone this video, and your smartphone is in your hand, and you drop it. Don't worry, it doesn't break, it ends up down here, and you pick it up, to start watching again. How far would you pick it up? I don't know, maybe a change in height of one meter. How much does the smartphone weigh? I don't know, uh, I haven't checked the specs on a smartphone these days, but maybe the mass is 300 grams, I don't know, third of a pound, something like that, 0.3 kilograms. And so you apply a force equal to gravity to get it to lift up, anything less and it won't go up, and you calculate the work done, the work which is the same as the delta EG is equal to mg delta H, and you plug in a value of 0.3 times 9.8 times 1 meter. And you get a certain number. I don't have my calculator handy, so I'm not going to bother with this. It's something like 3 joules, roughly. Imagine that at the same time that you do this, someone on the first floor of the building does the exact same thing. He or she drops his or her smartphone of the same mass down to the ground from the same height. This person bends down, lifts up the smartphone for one meter. It's the exact same smartphone, so it's 0 0.3 kilograms. And this person calculates the work. Of course, it's going to be the exact same calculation so this person will also get roughly the three joules that we got up here. So here's my question to you. They both did the same lifting, but from different points. They both did the same amount of work, right? Fair enough, that's easy to see. However, what I want you to consider is the following. If you, sorry, pardon me for one sec here. Hi folks, I'm back. Sorry about that little disruption there. I had to take care of something. However, getting back to what we were discussing, we were talking about these two people who were doing the exact same lifting of the exact same object 
but on different floors of the building. Now here's the question that I want you to consider. If they both do the same amount of work, and therefore they both think that the change in gravitational potential energy is the same, consider this. The person on the second floor, what would this person think would happen if, for whatever reason, he or she dropped the smartphone from this height, let's say out the window, down to the bottom of the first floor. Would the person still say that the object had the same amount of gravitational potential energy relative to the ground as he did before? No, because now the ground is much further down. So I guess what I'm trying to say in, in so many words is that changes in gravitational potential energy are relative to a certain what we call reference point. While this person on the second floor gave the object three extra joules of energy, gravitational potential energy, that's relative to the floor from which he lifted. But if the phone falls out the window and falls all the way down to the first floor, now the phone is probably going to smash because it's so much further down. It'll fall and gain a lot more kinetic energy in falling that greater distance. That's because relative to this point, this person's phone has a lot more gravitational potential energy. I use the word relative in there, and that should tell you or give you a hint that potential energy is measured relative to what we call a reference point. Okay? The person here might lift the phone and drop it again, but the phone would only fall one meter, not breaking, let's say, the same way this person's phone would fall all the way down to the same place and break. So when you're talking about gravitational potential energy, you have to specify a reference point. Is the reference point going to be the ground that you're sitting on? If so, the ground that you're standing on rather? If so, then that's what we might call the h equals zero meters point. Or is the reference point going to be down below you, maybe one story, uh, a story in a building is maybe three or four meters. So in that case, if this person made the height zero at the ground here, then the floor the person standing on is three meters, and now the height to which he initially raised the object would be one meter above that. It would be four meters. However, the neat thing is that even if you use the three and four meter mark, Look at what the delta EG would be. Delta EG would be EG final minus EG initial. That would be using this formula that we developed back here. And you would find the following. MGH final minus MGH initial that would be equal to, well, I can factor out an mg, mg, so we'd have mg h final minus h initial. The mass that we said was 0.3, g is 9.8, very close to 10. Height final, 4 meters for the lift up to the top, 3 meters for the initial height, so 4 minus 3. Guess what? you end up with the exact same answer that you had before. This is approximately 3 joules. Same as here, same as here. So the reference point matters depending on what sort of motion you're going to analyze, but luckily the amount of work done is the same in either case. It's really, in a way, just a matter of frames of reference. Okay, moving on. Three important questions that students often ask about gravitational potential energy. Number one, they're going to say, here you talked about lifting something straight up, but you don't always lift something straight up. Sometimes you lift on an angle. Can we still use the formula delta EG equals mg delta H? And the answer is yes. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Suppose you push an object up a ramp. A good example might, of this might be uh, at your school, there is a wheelchair ramp. Some people use the wheelchair ramp to get up to the entrance of the building. Some people 
uh, use the stairs. Is there a difference in terms of the work that they do on an object? Well, let's have a look. You might be surprised at the answer. Suppose you take a mass and you want to push it up a ramp. Well, then you've got to apply a force up the ramp that at least is equal to the force down the ramp. Otherwise, the object's not going to go anymore. Or go anywhere. Do you remember what this force is? We learned about it back in uh, when we did inclined planes. If you look back, you'll see that it's mg sine theta, where theta is the angle of inclination of the ramp. If you want to push a mass up that ramp, you've got to supply at least this force, so you've got to push mg sine theta worth of force. And I'll just put in F equals. Now suppose the vertical lift is what we've been calling delta H. We want to calculate the work done, and we know that this is F delta D cos theta. Now be careful here. The theta here is the angle between force and displacement, but the theta here is the angle of inclination. So what I'm going to do to avoid confusion is I'm going to use the Greek letter phi, that's P-H-I, over here so that you don't get confused with the theta in the work formula. Okay? Now, the force is directly up the ramp this way. The displacement is also directly up the ramp this way. So, while phi is whatever this angle is, maybe 10, 20, 30 degrees, theta, the angle between force and displacement, I hope you can see is zero degrees because these two vectors are parallel. So what's the work done? Well, it's mg sine phi, that's the force. Delta d is whatever the hypotenuse of that ramp is, and cosine of zero is equal to one. Now, let's take a look for a moment at delta d. Delta d is the displacement along here. That can be defined in terms of delta h. You have a trig ratio here. Sine of phi is opposite over hypotenuse. That's delta h over delta d. So that I can replace delta d equals delta h over sine phi. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sub that in here so that in the end I've got mg sine phi is the force I apply along the ramp. The displacement is just the vertical height divided by the sine of the incline angle. The one here we can ignore at this point. Look what happens. Sine of phi cancels and what do I end up with? mg delta h, the vertical height. All that matters when you lift something is the vertical height, not the slant length, if you want to call it that. And this is an important property of a force like gravity. It doesn't matter what path you take to get an object from one height to another. All that matters is the vertical distance traveled. mg delta h is the work done here. And that, of course, is your delta EG, the change in gravitational potential energy, path independent. Here's another question. What if you apply more force than FG? I've spent this whole video talking to you about applying just enough force to get an object to move up. Well, you and I both know that that's a pretty specific situation. What if you apply a little bit more force? Sometimes we lift something with more than just a minimum amount of force. Suppose you take a mass and you lift it off the floor and you lift it with as much force as you can so that this mass that I'm going to draw right here is it's experiencing a force of gravity which is mg but for whatever reason you've decided to lift it with much 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 more force and I'll show that with an F applied that I'm going to draw longer than mg then what would happen? Well, you might want to pause the video for a moment and think what happens if you apply a lot of force, much more than you really need, to lift something. Pause the video and just visualize what happens. Okay, and you're back. And I think you know that if you, well, you might actually end up throwing it up in the air uh, if you can't hang on to it. Uh, or at the very least, you're going to lift it up very rapidly. In other words, you're going to give it a lot more kinetic energy 
then you really need to. Like if you're just lifting a book up to a, a shelf, you don't need to move it very rapidly, do you? Well, think about this idea that we learned about just one lesson ago. W total equals delta EK. Let's think about the work done on an object that's being lifted, right? What forces are acting? That'll tell us the total work. There's F applied, so we write this. F applied delta D cos theta. There's also gravity, so we write Fg delta D cos theta. For delta EK, we write EK final minus EK initial. Now let's think for a moment. In both cases, the delta Ds are the same. We're lifting the object the same vertical height. In this case of the applied force, the applied force and the displacement are in the same direction. Delta H is up. Therefore, this theta will be zero degrees. You're lifting up and the object's moving up. But in this case, look at your free body diagram. Gravity points down, yet the object moves up. So that means this will be a 180. So what's going on here? The force you apply is doing F delta D cos theta, that's plus one, this is doing positive work on the object. However, gravity, the Earth itself, is pulling downward. It's doing cos 180. That's negative 1. That's negative work on the object. Since these are the same, and since these have the same value of 1, just one of them is positive, one's negative, what really matters here is your applied force versus the gravity force. If you lift with a lot more force than gravity is acting, then this number will be greater than this number. So can you see how this side of the equation is going to work out? F applied delta D cos 0 will be much more positive than Fg delta D cos 180 will be negative. Overall on this side, you will have a positive number. The total work will be positive. And as we've discussed in class, when the total work is positive, the change in kinetic energy will be positive. In other words, the object will gain kinetic energy. In other words, this will register a gain, meaning there is more EK final than there was EK initial. The object will speed up. Is that what you guessed when you paused the video a moment ago to visualize what would happen? if you lifted an object with a lot more force than the force of gravity? Well, I hope that is what you imagine because it makes sense. The formulas work. Finally, very last question that a lot of people ask about, and this is a really neat one. Why does the title of the video say gravitational potential energy at Earth's surface? So right back here, why this? Why did I have to say that? Why didn't I just call it gravitational potential energy? Well, Maybe some of you can see what the answer is. Maybe some of you are about to realize it. But the formula that we've been using for EG is MGH. And the formula we've been using for delta EG, the change in gravitational potential energy, is MG delta H for a change in height. So here's my question to you. Suppose you lifted something so high up that we weren't talking just meters like in lifting a book, and we weren't even talking, you know, like maybe tens or hundreds of meters, as in, let's say, getting into an elevator and going up a really large building. Suppose we were talking something really major, like launching a satellite, where the height that you're going to push an object upward is actually hundreds or maybe thousands of kilometers. Now we're going to start to have to visualize Earth as the sphere that it is, in space. And as you know from the videos um, where we talked about circular motion and satellite uh, uh, circular motion, the radius of the Earth being 6380 kilometers or something like that, if you launch a satellite up even a, you know, three, four, five, six hundred kilometers above the surface, it will now end up so high up, you know, as it prepares to orbit, sorry that was a really bad circle there, It'll be so high up, even as it 
is orbiting Earth, that something interesting happens. The value of g up here is less than 9.8. You know this because the force of gravity formula, when we're talking more like on planetary scales, is gm1 m2 over distance squared. You won't be able to use the 9.8 in this formula if the heights involved get really significant compared to the radius of Earth. Then what are you going to do? This formula, mgh and mg delta h, it assumes constant g. Well, if you're launching satellites, this is a bad assumption. What do you do? Well, the answer is you actually have to use some calculus ideas, and we're not going to touch on that until a couple chapters from now when we talk about a topic called gravitational potential energy, not at the Earth's surface, but in general. And then I think you're really going to like what we're going to talk about, because we'll talk about launching satellites, and we'll even get into really cool discussions about black holes. But i got to leave you... Uh, hanging so uh, to keep your interest uh, up there. So hang in there, just a couple more units to go and we will address this question. But for now, thanks for watching. I hope you understand gravitational potential energy in at the Earth's surface in a little bit more detail. Thanks. See you in class. Bye.